So now before we carry on, let's spend a little bit of time comparing Epsilon photography and coded photography. The aim so far I've set for the concept of coded photography is to encode into a single image information about the environment, the photographic signal from the environment, and then we can add a post capture after we've captured the image, decode it to actually go more information about the scene. We saw this example a little bit when we did light field cameras, right? It captured a stack of pictures into one image representation, and then we were able to do things like parallax and also change a focal lens. So coded photography basically is aimed at that kind of a process where we basically encode into the image itself additional information that would allow us to extract more kinds of images out of it at a later point, something that could actually capture depth, parallax, uh, even focal planes, and perhaps additional information. Epsilon photography basically says, rather than capture one image with all of that information, let's capture a series of images, a sequence of images, a sequential set of images that may have those different variations. Take a picture, change the focal length, take another picture. That basically means for example, if there was a fast-moving object, we would actually have trouble because we'd really like to have a much faster camera. In the case of coded photography, since it's doing all of that, and if it's fast enough in computing all of this, it can actually capture the image in one go. So that's basically one of the big differences here. Now, of course, the space that goes from coded photography and epsilon photography could be merged because we can actually combine them to be able to generate novel forms of images too. So one thing to note about coded photography is each image that we may capture in a coded photography signal would basically mean that the neighborhood pixels may have different variations. One pixel would have focal length at something, the other one next to it may actually have it at a different one. And knowing the code that relates both of them and knowing one the pixel at the left or the right was captured, we can actually decode it to generate something new and interesting. Again, an example that comes to mind is something I mentioned before, bear patterns, where knowing the pattern that this one is R, this one is G, and this one is B, and a square pattern allowed us to decode the image. In epsilon photography, of course, that variation is in time. Uh, all of this allows us to now, of course, create new images that can control light over time or space, because now we can capture a series of images, or one image that actually has those variations either in space or in time, and we can preserve details about the recorded environment. So in essence, what I'm trying to get to is that there's this big space that we could actually have between coded photography and epsilon photography. Both of them are useful, and they actually may even overlap a little bit in terms of what they can do. These are just labels that we're coming up to help us kind of define the space of different types of photographies, concepts that are related to computational photography. They may, of course, have both overlap between both of them. And again, at the end of the day, we're trying to figure out how to capture the best possible way of capturing an image that we can actually render differently.